Welcome everybody to Training 1, which is required knowledge uh, before you attempt the programs and regimens and exercises. This is where I want you to forget what you've already been taught, forget what you think you know about oral health and dental problems and stuff, because a lot of it is not totally true. A lot of it's dumbed down in kindergarten and some of it's actually wrong and dangerous. I like this saying by Einstein. He says, a clever person solves a problem and a wise person avoids it. And he also says, make things simple, but not too simple. And I agree with that because standard oral hygiene recommendations are too simplistic, don't get the point across properly. This training is really important because there's so many mis misconceptions. The first one is sugar equals decay, right? No, that's not true. Remember, microbes cause decay by fermenting carbohydrates into acids and enzymes that dissolve your enamel and eat the proteins in your teeth. Now, a lot of people think that the dentist is the center of the dental universe. Many times people come to the office and they say, sorry, doc, I didn't get in for a couple of years because I didn't have insurance or uh, I didn't have a dentist I could go to. They look at the dentist is going to save their life. And that's not the case. The dentist is going to fix stuff. What really saves a life is you. Okay. And then another misconception is brushing and flossing twice a day for two minutes each time. We'll get into that later in another training, but the truth is if you did two minutes twice a day for your whole life, the most you would possibly spend on your teeth if you lived to 95 would be about 91 days on your teeth. So uh, what we need is really this dental fitness renews oral method concept where it's kind of a lifestyle and you will learn that as we go. It takes some getting into. Now, part of the reason that the oral hygiene recommendations are so dumbed down is because it's just too hard to explain stuff. And that's why we have this course here. Okay. Because it takes a while to explain it all. And so that you get it. And I wish I could just simplify it a lot, but the problem is it's been simplified too much, too long. And then the people just really don't get it. It's kind of like saying I boiled down this book into three words, and then I boiled the th three words into one word. And then I forgot the word. You have to have a little bit more oomph to the oral hygiene stuff. So it makes sense. The beauty of understanding the, the base of the iceberg of dentistry and dental fitness and all that is that there are some really strange things that happen. And if you didn't know the background and the understanding of dental fitness, you wouldn't be able to figure it out. But knowing it, you can then figure it out and make sense. And here's a typical example. People with end-stage renal disease and they have kidney problems, they're on dialysis, they almost never get any cavities no matter what they eat, even if they're eating sodas and Twinkies all day long, which would be bad, okay? But they don't usually get decay at all. And you know why that is? That's because saliva has a little bit of urea in it normally, and people with end-stage renal disease they end up having about 50 times more urea in their saliva than usual because it's flooding their bloodstream. Right? That's why they have to go to dialysis. Okay. So this saliva tends to try to get rid of some of the urea. Well, urea can be metabolized into ammonia and, and, and uh, that's alkaline. And the, the saliva then becomes so alkaline that the acidophile bacteria that cause decay can't survive. Get it? So if the mouth is too alkaline for decay bacteria to survive, then you just don't get decay. <laughs> it's not a mystery. Another thing is that there are about 20 billion organisms in your dental plaque at any given time, even if you brush and floss because you miss a lot of them and they're on your tongue and they're in your tonsils. Earth has something like 8 billion humans and you got 20 billion microbes in your dental plaque and you grow about 100 billion per day because the dental plaque is like a womb that's birthing bacteria all the time. It's just phenomenal. I have a training coming up about the holobiont concept. That's fascinating. You got to read that and do that one. That's really something. If you ever wonder why you wake up in the morning with dog breath or sweaters on your teeth, well, that's because your mouth is basically an incubator or a stinkubator, as I call it, to incubate or stinkubate uh, about uh, 70 billion organisms while you sleep. And that's why I invented Breathific to help to incubate 
good bugs overnight, call them bugs, call microbes bugs, incubate good bugs overnight. And the good bugs help to kind of crowd out the bad bugs, or at least if you can grow a bunch of good bugs, that means the bad bugs can't grow as much. Uh, and they're all fighting for space, you see. So that's cool. That's why we shouldn't try to kill 99% of the germs in our mouth twice a day. That's silly. We need some of those uh, microbes to just kind of be like a little bit of a police force. Or just think about it. If your neighborhood is full of gang members, then you got a gang war, basically. But if you have one gang person in your neighborhood and the rest of them are good people, then that gang guy is going to probably be like on his best behavior, at least when he's around you to some extent. Okay. <laughs> I can't tell you how many patients ask me, why do I get decayed, doc? I don't eat candy. I don't drink sodas and stuff. And so I ask them, well, do you eat pasta? Yeah. Do you eat rice? Yeah. Do you eat chips? Yeah. Pretzels with uh, salt on them. Yeah. Well, those are all carbohydrates. And even though they're starches and more, a little more complex carbohydrates, but they're still carbohydrates. And the decay bacteria can ferment those and turn them into acids and destroy your teeth. Simple as that. By the way, fiber is really hard for the decay bacteria to ferment, so they don't really use it. Now let's talk about gum disease for a minute. You don't want gum disease, it's just terrible. I've already gone over a lot of that, but there are at least 60 nasty bugs. And of those 60, there are probably a dozen or so that are really terrible. And of those dozen, there are like five or so that are super terrible, and of those, there are one to three that are like absolutely the worst ever you can imagine. And Porphyromonas gingivalis is probably the godfather of all godfathers of nasty oral microbes. It's just horrible. And scientists have found evidence of Porphyromonas gingivalis bacterial cell walls in the brains of Alzheimer's patients in the plaques. And so somehow those pieces of bacterial cell walls are getting through the blood brain barrier and into the brain. And it's not necessarily causing Alzheimer's, but it, it's enough to cause inflammation in the brain that the brain tries to wall off. It's terrible. Porphyromonas gingivalis is found in other parts of the body too. And it gets in the bloodstream. It can get through your body and uh, it, it can even get into the pancreas and lead to problems there and get in your colon. It's just, it's just terrible. You know, gum disease actually kills you slowly. It kills you in slow motion. That's what it does. Frighteningly, gum disease doesn't usually hurt until it's advanced. And that's really scary to think about because you have a disease that doesn't seem to cause any pain or discomfort until it's practically too far along and it's killing you in slow motion. <laughs> so just think about this for a minute. Let's say you had wisdom teeth out and let's say you had braces. So you lost like eight teeth, okay? And if you have 32 teeth to begin with, you lost eight, that's 24 teeth, okay? So let's say you have 24 teeth and they all have an average of about four or five millimeter gingival crevice or gum pocket that bleeds a little bit. So if you took the circumference of each tooth, it would average out to about a, an inch for each tooth. So imagine you have a 24 inch cut on your arm or your leg or something that's about a quarter inch deep and it's oozing stuff and stinks. <laughs> Wouldn't you want to take care of that? What if you cleaned it all the time but it kept stinking and bleeding and stuff? Would you go to the doctor to fix that? Probably, right? So, uh, but if it's in your mouth and you don't really see that, um, why do you accept that? Why would anybody accept that? Uh, I don't understand that. But there are people who say, well, my gums bleed only when I floss or when I brush, but not normally. Okay, they bleed, that's not good, okay? By the way, some studies recently on COVID uh, reactions have found that some of the worst cases of COVID involve people who've also had gum disease and diabetes and stuff. And remember, diabetes and gum disease are intricately re related, a bi-directional relationship. Each one makes the other worse. And uh, gum disease can cause basically kind of system-wide inflammation, low grade, just like a smoldering fire all the time that's always kind of going somewhere in the background. You don't want that. So 
that's part of the reason. When people say they're all healthy, they might look healthy and all that, but if their gums are bleeding, they're not really healthy. I remember I said that gum disease germs are anaerobes. They hate oxygen. Oxygen is poison to them. If they get into your bloodstream, then why don't they die? Because your blood is oxygenated, right? Well, they're really insidious, these damn things. They form globs of plaque around the cells like a spacesuit, and they can hide in that and travel through your body like that. If they die, their cell walls have lipopolysaccharide, which is a poison and that can cause blood clotting. So you can have blood clots forming where dead gum disease bacteria have landed in your arteries and veins and stuff. It, it doesn't take a live microbe to kill you. You can have dead ones floating around and they'll be bad enough. Now most germs rely upon your ineffective standard oral hygiene methods of brush and floss twice a day for a couple of minutes, twice each time. That's the absolute least you can possibly do. So what needs to happen is basically a lifestyle, not just two sessions of dental workout. I keep saying that because it's important. Remember, oral irrigators can reach about six millimeters under the gums. They don't actually clean everything out, but they do irrigate and flush a lot of things. And if you use the peroxide, like I was telling you, that little bit of hydrogen peroxide in the water pick water is enough to really make life miserable for gum disease germs and other anaerobes down under the gums. If you don't see food shooting out from between your teeth, that doesn't mean the water pick isn't working. It means that you're using the water pick basically. <laughs> and the water pick is flushing microbial things out and those are microscopic, you can't see them. So you should just use it, case closed. Now what's the difference between plaque and tartar? Well, plaque is the beginning stage and it's biofilm. And then tartar is the end stage, which is uh, calcified biofilm. You can have your teeth cleaned and the second that you close your mouth and get some saliva on your teeth, they're starting to get plaque on them right away. And then in about 24 hours, you've already got a bunch of bacteria already forming little mats of, of cells and things like that. And then within about three days in areas that you can't get like way back by your wisdom teeth or in some areas where you have problems where you can't brush very well, uh, that stuff builds up and comes kind of slushy after three days. Your saliva has calcium phosphate and the calcium phosphate tends to crystallize onto anything, a denture, partial denture, braces and your teeth. After seven days, the calcified plaque is almost too hard to brush off. Certainly by 10 days, it's too hard to brush off. You need some kind of a scaler to get that stuff off. So that's why you have to go to the dentist twice a year. And remember that you can't get any deeper than about one and a half millimeters under your gums, even if you're using an electric toothbrush. Now you can flush six millimeters under your gums with a a water pick, but that's not actual mechanical uh, abrasion. And uh, actually with the Sonicare, it's not all mechanical either, because remember a millimeter is more like just fluid moving, kind of like water pick. So really the physical reduction of plaque and tartar is only about a millimeter and a half with floss and a toothbrush. That means if you have even shallow gums of about three millimeters deep, only half of that is able to be cleaned with any type of uh, thing, okay? That's why you need to go to the dentist to get your teeth scaled every, occasionally, even if it doesn't look like you have tartar. I just found out something uh, a few months ago. I was reading an article that said that the gum disease germs and gingivitis germs actually stimulate the epithelial cells in the lining of the, the gums to release calcium. And that would explain now why so many people get tartar under the gums further down along the sides of the roots. So, man, we're screwed, aren't we? <laughs> so that's why we have to kind of make it into a lifestyle where it's sort of like second nature just to do your stuff and reach for a stash of 
chewing gum or reach for your stash of picks or whatever that you have all over the house and in your briefcase and your car and so forth. Remember that not all dental plaque is bad. It's what's in the plaque that's what's bad, okay? You will not be able to remove all plaque all the time. All these advertisements that say it removes plaque, it gets rid of this, or you um, eliminates, it doesn't eliminate. It just manages, kind of. So your job is to basically manage your plaque so that you grow like a garden. You grow good things instead of weeds, okay? You're going to grow stuff anyway, but you want to grow good stuff. And that's where probiotics come in. You want to grow probiotics so that they help to fight the bad germs naturally. If you're relying on chemicals and toxins and stuff too much, you're just going to burn your mouth. You're going to kill off too many good ones. You're going to actually make the bad bugs a little hardier. And then you'll end up with mouth dysbiosis or gum colitis, uh, irritable bowel of the mouth, like I call it. And that's the problem. So the more natural we can get, the better it is. And I understand that in some cases, people really need to take fluoride if they're having cancer radiation or uh, chemotherapy and stuff, and they have super dry mouth. And we have to do whatever we can to try to kill germs for a while, at least, until they can maybe get off of their chemotherapy or their radiation. So thank goodness we have fluoride that we can use, especially the nanohydroxyapatite fluoride. And in this section, I have a graphic of how biofilm forms and the life cycle of biofilm and how the bacteria try to look for places and then they settle down and then they form a gel and then they grow and then they multiply and then they birth out and go around. And, and so if, if you identify those different stages in there, you can try to control certain stages and you'll start winning, you see? So it's pretty easy to kill microbes in the first stages where they're just kind of floating around in the mouth and they haven't attached anything yet and they haven't been calcified in yet. And that's the whole idea of trying to do a lifestyle where you're not just doing it twice a day and letting the bugs get entrenched and dig in for say eight hours all the time. Regarding doing your oral hygiene twice a day for two minutes each time, it's really actually pretty amazing to take the Steffen curves, and I'm going to go into that in a little bit. The Steffen curve is the graph of acidity in your mouth after you have some sugar. It turns out that within two minutes of eating some sugar, then you're already developing acids in your plaque. And within five minutes, it's really bad. And within 12 minutes, it's really terrible. And then it takes about an hour for your plaque to neutralize with regular saliva flow. So if you're like a lot of people and you like eat breakfast and then you have a coffee break and then you eat something at lunch and then another coffee break and then on the way home you stop and get something and you eat on the road or whatever and you get home and then you have a snack and then you eat dinner and then maybe you have a snack before you go to sleep or maybe then you get up and have a midnight snack. I mean, like when I was bodybuilding a lot, uh, I ate seven times a day and I thought to myself, wow, you know what? That's seven potential cavity attacks that I could have, plus whatever snacks I have. So I better actually up my dental fitness game. And then I did an Excel spreadsheet because I'm kind of a nerd. And I put all the figures in there about calories and plaque pH and timing and the two minutes and five minutes and 12 minutes and all that stuff. And I realized that, hey, two times a day of oral hygiene is really stupid. It's not going to work. So I started using a lot more xylitol gum and uh, I started flossing more and using water pick and everything. And luckily I didn't get any dental problems. A lot of people think that the dentist is the center of the dental universe. That's wrong. You are the center of the dental universe. The sun is the center of the solar system, not earth. Earth is not flat, okay? <laughs> and the dentist is not the center. You are the center. By that, I mean, you have the power, kind of like in The Wizard of Oz. You always had the power all along and didn't know it, okay? You're the hero. That's why I keep saying you're the hero, because it's really up to you. And I'm not trying to put the blame on you or anything like that. I'm just trying to let you know that, hey, you're the powerful one, actually. And you can say what's going on. You have control more than anybody. So that's all I'm trying to do is help you realize the control that you actually have. 
and then use it properly. Another misconception that people have is that they they don't have insurance or the dentist doesn't accept their insurance and they can't go to that dentist anymore. If you have a dentist and you like your dentist, you should stick with your dentist even if they don't take your insurance. You could probably negotiate with your dentist and and pay cash or something and get a similar deal and just get rid of your damn insurance because hey you're paying out of your pocket for insurance or it's getting taken out from your paycheck or something and if you do your dental fitness right it's like an insurance plan especially the people who have lost their benefits with the great resignation that's happened with the covid and they don't have insurance anymore and i don't want you to have to go to the dentist and have a ton of work done that was really 80 percent preventable I can tell you that most dentists hate insurance. It's terrible. They always have to fight with the insurance. They have to do all kinds of narratives and take pictures and prove stuff all the time. I know of one company in Southern California that got sued for millions of dollars because the insurance was so crappy that insurance would only cover a crown on a tooth that had something like three broken parts to it. It couldn't be just one piece broken. It had to have three broken pieces on the tooth and then then stupid insurance would cover a crown. So this company would then drill off of another piece and then take an x-ray and say, well, there's, it's gone now. And so then they build the insurance. Well, that's wrong, of course, but hey, it's wrong for insurance to require something to be so darn broken that it's gonna actually probably have to be extracted almost. It's just terrible, but These insurance companies, they're in it for the money, most of them. And the less they have to pay out, the better, and the more they can pay their parasite leaders, okay? (laughs) Don't get me started on insurance. Besides, how can you insure dental problems? Dental problems are universal. Dental problems are the second most common human affliction. You, You can't insure something that happens to everybody, a lot, actually. Now, of course, death happens to everybody, And if you drive a car, you're likely to have an accident at some point, but you're not having accidents every day, twice a day, or twice a year, or three times a year. Hopefully, you're not dying every day and all that stuff. Your house isn't burning down all the time. So you can ensure things that are bad and catastrophic, but are rarely happening. But dentistry isn't really totally catastrophic, although dental problems kill you slowly over lifetime. But My point is it's really hard to insure for something that happens to everybody all the time and the second most common human thing. And the only way that the insurance company can make money is to delay, confuse people and make limitations and require to have high co-payments and non-covered items and all that stuff. They just make it really hard for you to use it. You know something, I've never had dental insurance and I never will. I think I've spent only about 6000 or so dollars on my teeth since I was about age 18. And I'm 66, almost 67 now. And I only spent about 6000 because six of my teeth cracked. So if I hadn't had six cracked and broken teeth, I probably would have spent maybe a thousand total or something on my teeth in all those years. In fact, I have a crown that my dental school partner made for me down here in about 1985 and it's still there. By the way, I took a course from a dentist who got so sick and tired of insurance that he just rebelled and he wouldn't accept any insurance and he just simply decided to charge patients $400 an hour, like a lawyer. If a crown took him 30 minutes to trim, it was like 200 bucks instead of a thousand or whatever. So that's fair. I think. And insurance didn't get involved in all that. And what that means is that many times, if you don't have insurance, you can probably negotiate with your dentist and offer cash or say that you're going to write a great review and refer people and things like that and do it actually. And you might be able to get half off even or pay only 80% or 75% or something like that. So in summary, remember that tooth decay is not caused by sugar. Tooth decay is an infectious microbial transmissible disease that is caused by at least four different microbes that are bacteria and one fungus. And they're oxygen tolerant. They prefer to eat carbohydrates 
They produce acids and enzymes that dissolve and digest your teeth. And everyone catches these germs from each other. And we got them from our moms when we were babies and from the hospital and stuff. And they just uh, keep coming over the years. The microbes are everywhere all around us. We're breathing them in, we're breathing them out. Um, can't get away from them. You always have them. Even if you try to kill 99% of them all the time, they come back anyway. You just try to grow the right ones, okay? And you can do that. You can actually change your, your gut microbiome and you can change your oral microbiome by eating right and following certain diets, like the Mediterranean diet, like I said, and using probiotics and stuff. Remember that gum disease is an infectious microbial disease caused by at least 60 microbes. And they eat mostly proteins, not carbohydrates. And the proteins that they eat are mostly you. And even if you don't eat proteins, you have to anyway, but even if you didn't eat proteins, the gum disease germs are metabolizing the gingival curricular fluid that comes out from your gums and leaks out into your mouth through your gums like tears from your eyes. There's plenty of food in that gingival curricular fluid to feed gum disease germs forever. You remember the comedy film City Slickers with Billy Crystal and Jack Balance in it as Curly? <laughs> And Curly said, the one thing, you know, everything else is crap. You just got to do the one thing in life. If I could boil this course down to just one thing, I thought about this a lot. And I think that the one thing would probably be keep stuff from staying on your teeth longer than 12 minutes. That's it. But how you do that is like a bunch of different things. <laughs> And, and a bunch of those different things are different for everybody. Okay. Seems like, and that's why I have this course so that you can find things in here that work for you and your lifestyle and so forth and your habits. Remember, you're not totally healthy unless you have oral health. Okay. Poor oral health affects your entire body through the oral systemic link. That's your bloody gums and gingivitis gums that you don't know are bloody or gingivitis -y <laughs> until you floss or go to the dentist and have them poke around. So dental prevention is really like a 24 seven thing you've got to do, not twice a day for two minutes each time. Doesn't work that way. No wonder dental problems are still the second most common human affliction because it's not a lifestyle yet for people. It's gotta be like picking up the trash, pushing your shopping cart back, if you drop something in the supermarket, in the fruit section, you pick it up and put it back. You push your cart back. You walk the stairs as much as possible. You know what I mean? And lastly, diabetes and Alzheimer's are on track to derail our healthcare system by 2050 if we don't start doing something now. And that's why I rant and rave about gum disease and diabetes because if you can improve your gums, which is actually pretty easy to do with dental fitness, then guess what else happens? You start improving your diabetes situation, your A1C situation, and then your oral systemic link is reduced. And then you're not getting those Porphyromonas gingivalis bacteria so much in your bloodstream or hardly any or no, none, I hope. And then guess what? Their cell walls are not getting into your brain and that's it. So remember, 80% of most common dental problems are easily preventable, easily, if you just do things right. Okay, so that sums it up for this training. Okay, go team.